my fellow artists, my name is Lauren, I am the artist behind Potato Art Studios, and in this video I'll be demonstrating how I colored a polar bear with pastels. So if you're interested in seeing how I drew this polar bear, just keep on watching. So to start off, if you haven't seen my first part of this polar bear video, which is how I found this image and how I set up the file on my computer, I'll have a a link to that video in the upper right hand corner and also down below. During this video, if you find any information from it useful, please give it a thumbs up and I would really appreciate it. So starting off with the drawing, I decided not to film the actual sketch process because that's quite boring to look at, but we're going to get in to it by coloring in the background and so the way I do backgrounds is quite messy and because of the nature of pastels they're very easy to blend and especially on this paper which is a Claire Fontaine pastel mat and the color I'm using is brown and the size is 8 by 10 inches and the nature of this paper um, because of its unique surface texture, it allows you to blend pastels and build layers very, very easily and quickly. So the process of doing the background was probably under an hour or so. It was very fast to build up that blue color. And after I have the background in, I like to start generally mapping the darker shades on my main subject first and that kind of gives me a baseline of the value range I'm working with. And as a guideline, um, if you use, I find that if you use white too early on, it actually ends up muddying a lot of your colors. So I try to not use the bright white highlights um, in fur straight away. I try to hold off on using a pure white on my drawing. And for the first layer of pastels, I'm doing something a little bit different. Um, normally I just loosely color by, basically do a paint by numbers where I define an area that would be a brown or define an area that would be a light yellow and just kind of color in directly with my soft pastels. Um, but I had recently seen a video from Jason Morgan where he goes in and applies the initial layers of color with a sponge uh, blending knife and so that's what I'm doing here with the number one blending knife from Soft Tools and I will have that product linked down below um, but basically I have the blending knife rub against my soft pastels and pick up product and then deposit the product that sticks onto that sponge tip applicator onto my piece of paper. So the amount of pigment I am directly applying is much lighter than if I were to just go in straight with my soft pastel sticks. And so I'm my thinking was using the blending knife more extensively early on would help me build more layers of color because I'm not oversaturating the paper with layers of pastels too quickly. So by using the blending knife, it's limiting how much product I can put on the paper at any given time. And so hopefully that will mean that for me, I will be able to work with more layers. And so now after I have the Basically, the entire area of the polar bear has some pastel pigment on it. I'm using the pastel sticks and also pastel pencils to begin refining those areas. So in the areas that I had colored brown, I'm going to go in with a darker brown, um, both with my pastel sticks and pastel pencils. And you'll see that I'm alternating between blending pastel the pastels out with the blending knife and also adding color. So in order to build up that fur texture, I'm trying to build up layers of details. And for the background, um, I had 
when I initially colored the background in, I had a, I left a margin of error between the outline of the polar bear and the background. And that's because I didn't want to cover the sketch early on with the background color. But now that I have the polar bear basically mapped out, I can have the edge of the background basically approach the edge of the polar bear so that I don't have a weird gap where you can see the paper color because there's no pastel pigment on it. And I think at this stage I was a little bit impatient so I decided that I was going to go in with doing the details on the bear's back and I would probably advise to not do details too early on because I feel like I had not established the base colors correctly. So you'll see that later on in this video I'm going to actually end up redoing a lot of these colors because I basically jumped to doing details too early on. So you see that on the polar bear's face I have a lot of colors that I'm working with and um, even though the picture looks like the polar bear is mainly a tan or yellow color, I wanted to make sure that I also paid attention to that blue that was around the bear's nose and mouth. And so because yellow and blue make green and you don't want to have green in odd places because it looks a little bit strange, I had to be very careful about the areas that I was coloring blue and the areas that I was coloring more of a yellow tone um, because when you blend the blue and green to, or blue and yellow together of course they're going to get green and it's not going to be a very natural looking or realistic green. And so one trick that I learned while I was coloring was that I could look into my video, my camera's viewfinder periodically and see if I was going in the right direction and basically I was trying to get a feel for my overall drawing by viewing it in a very small format through my camera's viewfinder and that kind of gave me an indication of whether or not I was building up enough color in the right place because when you're looking at your drawing when it's scaled down to about an inch or two inches wide, you really can understand the areas that are in light and shadow. And sometimes when you're drawing and you're drawing with your face a foot away from the paper, you kind of lose a sense of the bigger picture because you're so focused on working on a tiny square inch at a time. And so when I was working, I tried to make it a habit to look at my camera's viewfinder every five or ten minutes just to make sure that I was heading in the right direction. And so another thing that I tried to do differently in this drawing compared to my previous drawings was that I intentionally cut the paper to be wider than the dimensions of the drawing. So my drawing I wanted to do was 8 by 10 inches and so the paper I cut was 9 by 11 inches, or sorry, I left a quarter inch margin, so the paper size is actually 8.5 by 10.5 inches. And so that meant that after I had drawn my one inch guides, I basically have a quarter inch margin around the entire drawing. And so later, on, later during the drawing, as you see here, when I'm trying to check if a detail or a feature is placed in the right position, um, because my one inch grids had been covered by pastels, I could still rely on the markings on the very perimeter of the drawing to place my ruler. So I could line up my ruler to the paper and do just a quick check to see if I'm putting the right detail in the right spot. And here I'm marking the clumps of fur and you'll see that I'm just doing that by drawing a small curved line to indicate the shadow of that tiny clump of fur. 
and I didn't notice this when I selected my photo, but the polar bear's fur is actually damp, and that's why the fur is kind of aggregated into tiny clumps. So instead of looking at a smooth coat, because the polar bear, I guess, had emerged from the water recently, um, his fur is actually bunched up into clumps. And that's a good and a bad thing. It's a bad thing because that is a lot more detail, but it's a good thing because those shadows formed by those small clumps of fur actually follow a lot of the contours of the bear's face. So even though it's a lot of information, the shadows don't have to be very accurate. You can just basically have the general idea of the plane of the area you're working on and just draw a curved line and going in that general direction and that will indicate that that area is um, or how that will indicate how the fur is laying so it is a lot of detail I think it's probably 100 or 200 shadow lines I ended up drawing but if you were to overlap my final drawing on top of the original picture, I would say maybe 5 or 10% of the fur would be spot on accurate to the photo. Um, but the more important thing and the takeaway I want you to know is that it doesn't have to be pixel for pixel accurate. It can just be close enough and because you understand the underlying structure of the polar bear's face, um, you can make a convincing illusion that your patches of fur on the polar bear are lying in a way that is realistic. So a person who's looking at your drawing understands that it's a polar bear and nothing looks out of place because the areas of shadows and highlights that I'm trying to draw, they're based on how they would theoretically sit on the polar bear's face. Even though it might not be accurate to the photo, it's done in a way I think that makes logical sense. So I don't worry about something being extremely accurate. I mean, for eyes and noses, yes, you do have to make sure that those are very accurate because someone can tell if something is even a 30 second of an inch off. But for fur and like extraneous details, they do not need to be 100% accurate. So it's easier and gives it's less pressure for myself because I don't have to be concerned with making every single tiny clump of fur in the exact right position. Um, so I don't need to spend a hundred hours on this piece. I mean, I could if I really wanted to, but that would mean I would only make one video a month. And that semi-clear sheet that you see me often lay down on the right-hand side of the, sh the drawing where my hand is resting, um, that's called glassine, and it's a very smooth paper um, similar to wax paper. And that's basically a physical barrier between my hand and the drawing. So when I'm resting my hand on my drawing board, I'm not rubbing off any of the pastels that are already on the paper. And so if you can't find glassine at your local art store, um, you can also use like parchment paper or wax paper. Basically any kind of smooth surface would be great to help um, prevent your hand from smearing your own work. And so the good thing about glassine is that it's acid free, so there's nothing that can transfer, no chemicals or acids from the paper that can transfer onto my drawing and potentially affect any colors. Um, so if you can find it, I would highly recommend grabbing either a pad of glassine sheets or a roll of glassine. I think also tracing paper or the pads of disposable palette sheets would work as well. Um, 
basically that really smooth surface is um, what, what's important. And so for, this is one of my favorite areas and that is the defining the border between the polar bear and the background. And so the effect right now is that it's a little bit fuzzy and hazy just because of how the sponge blending tool blended that area. But now we're going to go in and really define that fur. So you'll notice that the base color I have is a very muted light blue and a somewhat warm gray and a light beige color. And that gives a good groundwork for when I'm going in with those bright highlights that are bright white and yellow. So because of, I have those muted colors underneath that basically act like the shadows that would be between the fur. So at this stage, I didn't like the amount of contrast with the polar bear in the background. So to make the polar bear look like he's really, really glowing, I decided that I was going to darken the entire background. So to redo the background, I don't want to erase it completely, but I want to take off that top coat of pastel so that I can layer another coat of a darker color on top. If I were to just go in and try and apply a darker color over my current background, the amount of white that's already present would actually make it harder for me to darken it. So you'll see that I'm using this makeup blending sponge to take off that top layer of color. So there's still pastel pigment embedded deep into the layer of the paper, but I'm just taking that top layer off so that it's easier for me to darken the whole background. And so here I didn't like how that back area was, so I decided that I was going to actually redo portions of it, um, like I mentioned earlier. So I, the back wasn't as bright as I wanted it to be, so I took a smaller um, makeup sponge and took off that top layer of pastel, and that allows the white pastel to lay on top of the existing colors much more cleanly, and so it'll show up even brighter. So an important element of making something look bright is actually contrast, and the contrast of colors and also the contrast of values and saturation. So my polar bear in general terms is a light tan yellow bear, and the background is a fairly dark value that's a very saturated blue. So because I have a light object right immediately next to something that's very dark, that contrast is what makes the bear glow. If I had drawn this exact drawing on a white background and not done anything to the negative space where there's no polar bear, my polar bear would not look like it's glowing. It would just, it would still look like a polar bear, but because there's no contrast um, with the foreground subject and the background, the polar bear would not look like it's glowing. So in this case, I really wanted to push that, that glowing aspect of it, so I decided to increase the saturation of the background's blue, which increases the contrast and really emphasizes that the polar bear is glowing from the sun hitting its, um, the top of its head. And I think in these final stages, I'm basically doing the very finishing touches so on those tiny clumps of hair, I'm darkening any shadows between those clumps. And I'm also creating the very tiny highlights at the tips of those clumps of fur. And I think we're done. So if you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos from me in the future, you can always subscribe and turn on your notifications.
I try to post new art videos every Tuesday and I also sometimes post bonus videos on the weekends. So thank you very much for watching and I will see you in my next video.